TSR-2, Britain's new tactical strike and reconnaissance aircraft, makes its maiden flight at Boscombe Down in Wiltshire. With a Canberra and a Lightning escorting it, the 15-minute flight brought an end to three months of postponements, if not an end to the controversy. Some say that TSR-2 may be obsolete before it's in service, that missiles could be developed to intercept it even at low-level altitudes. It's designed to fly at hedge-hopping height, below enemy radar, faster than the speed of sound. It can also fly high and carry nuclear or conventional weapons. Missiles with a television eye will show the pilot pictures of the target. Cameras in the plane will send live pictures of a battlefield straight back to base. It's the most advanced airborne weapon system ever developed. So it seems a bit churlish to criticize it on the grounds that at some future date, it may not seem so revolutionary. After World War II, the British aircraft industry entered into a golden era of design, development, and manufacturing. They had a large leg up on most other countries in this respect due to the fact that they had developed their own jet engine during the war years, the United States was behind on its own jet engines, and Germany had all but been wiped off the map by the Allies. Great Britain came out of the war positioned to become a world leader in jet aircraft manufacturing. The Gloucester Meteor jet plane had been built and developed by the British during World War II. This would prove to be a massive advantage for them after the war ended. They already had a proven jet aircraft, pilots who knew how to fly them, and Frank Whittle, the man who was almost solely responsible for the Allies' jet plane programs. In 1944, the British Air Ministry had issued a request for his successor to the de Havilland Mosquito Bomber. In the request, it was said the new plane needed to be capable of high altitude and high speeds. Both of these requirements were best suited to a jet-powered aircraft. During the war, the English Electric Company had been licensed to build aircraft for the war effort. The company became quite suited to building aircraft this way. After the war was over, the chairman, Sir George Nelson, decided English Electric would continue on in the aircraft business. In 1945, English Electric created its own in-house design team to work with the new requests sent out by the British Air Ministry. What would come out of this team was the B-57 Canberra, one of the most successful early jet aircraft that was built. The Canberra would be a good tactical bomber and reconnaissance aircraft, but the British needed the ability to carry nuclear weapons thousands of miles to their delivery points inside of the Soviet Union. The V-bombers would be designed and built in the early to mid-1950s, and they would prove to be the perfect intercontinental nuclear strike aircraft. They were huge, high-flying bombers akin to their American cousins, the B-47 and B-52. But by the late 1950s, the Soviets had introduced surface-to-air missiles, which would easily reach the altitudes these bombers were flying at and shoot them down effortlessly. The entire strategy of a nuclear strike bomber had to be reevaluated. The concept of flying high out of the reach of fighters and missiles was over. Enemy radar would easily pick up these large, slow moving bomber groups and they would be shot down long before they ever got to their targets. The new strategy would be fly low and fast as possible. Low flying planes are hidden easily by flying low and under the radar. Low flying planes are also almost impossible for surface to air missiles to shoot down. Combine that with supersonic speed so that the fighters being scrambled to attack the bombers could not possibly have a chance to catch up to them before they reach their targets, and you have a recipe for success. The problem was the Royal Air Force did not have any planes designed to fly sustained supersonic speeds that low to the ground. The atmosphere at low altitude is much harder to fly through than it is at 40,000 feet, due to the air density being so much higher. The Ministry of Supply decided it was time to build a new plane to fill this need. They began work with English Electric on the basic requirements this new aircraft would need in 1955. The earlier parameters decided on would feature a plane that would have a 2,300 mile ferry range, would be able to fly at Mach 1.5 at low altitude. It would need a crew of two, a pilot and a crew member to operate the advanced navigational equipment needed to fly low without danger such as running into a mountain. A general operational requirement was issued in 1956, making the requirements official. Various aircraft companies in Britain began to work on the project in March of 1957. The requirements were really pushing the edge of what was even technologically possible in the mid-1950s. A supersonic, all-weather aircraft that could deliver nuclear weapons over long distances and also be capable of short takeoffs and landings, or takeoffs and landings on primitive runways. This, after all, was a doomsday bomber. 
It needed to be able to operate under conditions that could mean most modern infrastructure was damaged or completely destroyed. Not only was the new bomber up against a technological wall, it was already under fire from the defense minister Duncan Sandy. He said in 1957 that the era of manned combat was at an end and ballistic missiles were the weapons of the future. This was obviously a strong statement and it was vigorously debated within the Ministry of Defense for years after it was written. Senior Royal Air Force officers stated that they did not believe this to be true and that the TSR-2 had the potential to replace the Canberra and the entire V-bomber force, which would reduce their overall budget for maintenance on so many various aircraft. Even more political pressure was put on the project in 1957 when the Minister of Defense issued yet another requirement, stating that the only design proposals that they would review had to be collaborations between two or more companies. There were also competing projects, such as the Royal Navy's Blackburn Buccaneer, which was a low-level, subsonic attack aircraft designed for use over water. Former First Sea Lord, Lord Mountbatten, stated that five Blackburn Buccaneers could be built for the price of just one TSR-2. RAF pushed back against this claim, pointing out that the Buccaneer did not have anywhere near the performance that a low-level supersonic nuclear strike bomber would need to be successful. In between the political bickering, there had been much development work being performed on the aircraft. English Electric had teamed up with Short Brothers and submitted this proposal, which involved a vertical lift capability aircraft. Designs were also submitted by Avro, Blackburn, De Havilland, Hawker, and Vickers Armstrong. The Air Ministry poured over these reports and designs and finally settled on the Vickers proposal, which included an entire systems layout, from avionics to support facilities and logistics. The English Electric design was also considered, and ultimately, a deal was made that Vickers Armstrong would team up with English Electric in a mutually beneficial relationship to construct and finish development of the new bomber. On January 1, 1959, the project was given an official go-ahead. The initials of the plane would be derived from Tactical Strike and Reconnaissance Mach 2, TSR-2. English Electric and Vickers worked diligently to design and build an aircraft they wanted to have in the air by 1963 but they were also in the middle of a larger merger under the umbrella of the British Aircraft Company at the time. The bomber would be powered by two Bristol Sidley Olympus afterburner turbojet engines, each producing 22,000 pounds of thrust dry and 30,610 pounds with afterburner. More advanced versions of the ones used in the Avro Vulcan and would later power the Concorde. The plane had a high-mounted delta wing featuring downturned tips and an all-moving tailplane with a large all-moving fin. To achieve short takeoffs, blown flaps were featured. The wing loads of the plane were also very high. This was by design. Since the plane would be flying at such a high speed and low altitude, it would be subject to a lot of atmospheric turbulence. This high wing load would help stabilize the aircraft. The TSR-2 was capable of sustained crews at Mach 2.05 at 37,000 feet. It had a dash speed of Mach 2.35, which was only limited due to the leading edge of the wings being heated to almost 300 degrees Fahrenheit or 140 degrees Celsius. Its theoretical top speed at 45,000 feet was Mach 3 in level flight. The plane was designed to fly a 2,000 pound bomb up to 1,200 miles, most of it at an altitude of just 200 feet at approximately Mach 0.95. When the bomber was within 100 miles of its target, the plane would climb up higher and increase speed to Mach 1.7, drop its payload, and then return back down to 200 feet and return to its cruise speed of Mach 0.95 and return home. The avionics of the aircraft were some of the most advanced of the 1960s. This would also be the reason the cost of the project spiraled out of control. It featured forward-looking radar and side-looking radar, which allowed navigational fixing and a very advanced autopilot system to be used. The plane could use terrain-following navigation while on autopilot and reduce crew fatigue on long missions. The plane made its first flight at Boscombe Down, Wiltshire on September 27, 1964. A strange vibration caused by a fuel pump actually vibrated at the same frequency as the human eyeball, causing pilots to go blind momentarily, which was alarming due to the fact it only occurred during landings. The problem persisted to one extent or another for most of the testing. The first supersonic flight was achieved when the plane was being flown from Boscombe Down to Back Wharton. During the flight, the aircraft achieved Mach 1 without afterburners. Due to the strange vibration issue, the pilot of the TSR lit one afterburner, resulting in the plane running away from its chase plane, an English Electric Lightning, which had to fire both of his afterburners to catch up to the TSR. In fact, many of the test pilots described flying the TSR was much like flying a bigger, heavier Lightning. Over the next six months, a total of 24 test flights were conducted. The test plane was a stripped-down version of what would be a production plane, 
It wasn't fitted with any of the advanced radar or navigation systems. The tests were mainly to get the flight controls calibrated and the basic airframe shakedowns out of the way. Plane flew beautifully according to most test pilots involved in the program. Speeds of Mach 1.12 at an elevation of only 200 feet were achieved during this test period, but the last test flight occurred on March 31, 1965. Cost had continued to soar and concerns began to be brought up about this inside of the companies involved and the government ministries overseeing the development of the plane. At two cabinet meetings on April 1, 1965, it was decided to cancel the TSR-2 on the grounds of project cost. The decision was made to instead buy up 110 F-111 aircraft. The decision was announced in the budget speech on April 6, 1965. The second TSR-2 was due to make its maiden flight that day of the announcement, but it never happened. Ultimately, only the first TSR-2 ever took flight. When the employees of the British Aircraft Company got word of the decision to purchase F-111s from the United States over continued development of the TSR-2, they held a protest march. A week later, the Chancellor defended the decision in a debate in the House of Commons, saying buying the F-111s would prove to be a cheaper solution than continuing the TSR-2 project. The Air Ministry placed an order for 10 F-111s in April of 1966, with an additional order of 40 or more being placed in April of 1967. The F-111 program, however, also suffered massive inflation of costs. Combined with the British pound being devalued, the cost of these aircraft were going to far exceed the projected cost of the TSR program. The order for 50 F-111s was eventually cancelled in January of 1968. The Royal Air Force eventually used F-4 Phantoms and Blackburn Buccaneers to fill the role of the TSR-2. Many of the technologies and manufacturing methods learned in the TSR-2 program were used to build and develop the later Tornado program. Two TSR-2 airframes eventually survived. All of the other tooling, jigs, and many of the part complete aircraft were all scrapped within six months of the program being cancelled. The only TSR-2 to ever fly was taken to a test range and used as a target to test the vulnerability of modern airframes and systems to gunfire and shrapnel. Such a sad ending for such an amazing aircraft. It was essentially killed by political bickering and inner branch competition. Alright guys, well I hope you enjoyed the video. Like, comment, subscribe, do the usual, comment on my stuff. Let me know what you think. Um, tell me your opinion about the TSR-2 and how it basically was killed by its own government. You guys keep watching the videos and I'll keep making them. Alright, well thanks.